Okay, so uh, I will give uh, a short overview of uh, the genesis of where uh, Fable is coming from and what the Global Consortium is, uh, is doing. And then later on, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, will talk about uh, the UK specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the basic motivation and ambition uh, of Fable is to find pathways, uh, future pathways, uh, uh, to feed uh, currently 7.6 billion people, but then in the future it goes up uh, in our scenarios to, to nine and even, uh, even more billion. Um, the other issue to mention is that uh, the agricultural sector globally is actually providing the livelihood of about uh, 2.5 billion people. So there's also a, a job uh, uh, issue, a job market issue to, to the problem. And then uh, if you take kind of uh, the nature-based economy definition, uh, there were calculations that it's still 50% of global GDP. So here it's not only about uh, the food system GDP, but also forest sector, mining, tourism, and so forth. Hmm. So uh, what we are talking about is, is a very large chunk of, uh, of the global economy. And at the same time, uh, we actually need to make sure that we stay within planetary boundaries. Uh, and planetary boundaries doesn't only mean uh, climate policy, but it's also the integration and coordination uh, with uh, policies uh, that ensure um, biosphere integrity with respect to uh, uh, biodiversity, but also biogeochemical flows, uh, land use systems, uh, fresh water, and so forth. Uh, so this is, this is really the, the, the large ambition. And uh, uh, when we now look into what uh, jointly countries deliver for the respective global political processes, uh, uh, you actually get a little bit into frustration and you start to understand the challenges. And here I just plot uh, uh, some work uh, we, we did uh, two years ago where we looked at uh, uh, on the aggregate where countries together are in terms of their business as usual trajectorium, their pledges and what countries should actually do be to to be compliant with uh, uh, the 1.5 or 2 degree uh, world by 2100. And what you see is that there are uh, huge, huge uh, ambition gaps. Uh, and uh, uh, when you look into the details, in this case, uh, of the national determined uh, action plans of countries, uh, many times the LULUCF sector, that the, the land sector is actually not even properly represented at all or very poorly. And at the same time, we see that global models that provide kind of the, the, the long term, term trajectoria for the 1.5 uh, degree scenario, they actually disconnected from the realities uh, in, uh, in countries. And this gives us the basic uh, raison d'etre uh, for, for Fable to exist. And uh, just specifically, when you look at uh, the pledges that were done for Paris and now they're uh, ratched up a little bit, but by far also not meeting the targets. What you see is that uh, the, 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 the national reports actually suggest uh, in the baseline uh, a business as usual that's going even up. Uh, the INDCs in that case uh, could be interpreted as a uh, kind of continuation of business as usual if you take uh, the recent trends into account. And this is where we actually should be. Um, so there is there is uh, a lot to be done, and this basically uh, uh, this uh, basic frustration and the uh, appreciation of this large challenge uh, led us to initiate uh, this consortium. And uh, now we are uh, twenty country teams, uh, and as you see on the map, we are covering really the very large countries, uh, both developed and developing countries. Uh, we still have gaps in Africa, which we're trying to fill, but uh, overall uh, we have uh, probably critical, enough critical mass to actually push, push off a larger avalanche uh, of ambition, so to say. Um, so what, we, what do we do specifically? What we are after are uh, globally consistent long-term national pathways. And, uh, uh, and the national pathways, they should reflect the realities, the preferences uh, of individual countries. Um, 
which in the end together uh, play out to meet global targets. In order to do so, uh, one means in order to get uh, uh, consistency international pathways is actually to harmonize uh, trade assumptions across countries uh, such that uh, at least trade balances are closed. And then uh, what we have seen, uh, as I showed in the previous slides, uh, countries are typically far away from what's actually required uh, in terms of their current ambitions. So a ratcheting up uh, process needs to be uh, installed. And this is uh, what we do, and I will talk about the mechanisms a little later. Uh, we go through iterations with all countries in order to get more ambition uh, into country, country plans. Um, how do we do this technically? So uh, first uh, we look into, we actually take a starting point. Uh, we take uh, FAO national data, we put it into the database and we communicate with uh, the specific countries whether or not we can improve on the very basic input data sets. So these are uh, land use balances, but also food balances, uh, biodiversity information and so forth. Uh, then uh, we uh, prepare the joint models. Uh, typically, currently we use uh, an Excel-based calculator. Um, then uh, what we also engage in the scenario building, we have developed a verification tool where we just look at plain errors, but also we spot uh, unreasonable assumptions. So let's say on excessive uh, assumptions of uh, agricultural productivity, for example. And uh, we strive for consultation with uh, stakeholder engagement that we get vetting of the scenarios, uh, uh, of the pathways. Uh, from national stakeholders. This is then aggregated up uh, to the global level and we try to meet uh, several global, global targets. Um, so uh, more specifically with respect to the, the Excel uh, Fable calculator, we have uh, quite a lot of detail in terms of uh, uh, products. Uh, currently, we have included about 76 products of uh, crop, livestock, uh, oils, uh, but also uh, forest sector commodities. Um, we do these scenarios in five-year time steps uh, and how we construct the scenarios, it's in such a fashion that we first uh, determine demand uh, and demand, uh, you will see later, uh, will be uh, kind of uh, modeled in terms of any uh, and continuation of uh, current diets, but also we, we are quite engaged in defining uh, diet shifts. Uh, and uh, we also take care of uh, the very nature of, uh, of land use, that uh, land is a li limited uh, resource, uh, and so there is competition for land uh, induced in the scenarios. Um, just uh, finally, to give you an illustration how what we call Senaton, which is uh, kind of a, a scenario marathon, like a hackathon, uh, where we construct uh, these uh, national and joint, jointed up uh, uh, global scenarios. So what we basically do is uh, we have these calculators on, on the national level. Uh, we do allow for bilateral coordination, which sometimes happens, but many times it doesn't. Uh, and uh, we look uh, through kind of a linker platform. Uh, we look out for trade consistency. Um, once uh, trade consistency is achieved, uh, we display the globe, the outcomes uh, of uh, the individual of the of the sum of individual contributions by countries in a global dashboard. And if we see that we don't uh, meet the global goals, uh, be it uh, biodiversity, greenhouse gases, food security, and so forth, uh, we go into a new iteration and we iterate. Uh, basically pledging even more, uh, uh, as long as uh, we uh, meet all of the global targets. Uh, and then we, we, we finish the, the Senaton. So uh, with this, uh, I will now hand over uh, the presentation to uh, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Michael, for that uh, overview of the FABLE process. 
Um, and now let's hand over to Paula, who's going to go into the details of the results from the latest UK assessment. Thanks, Jim. So th this is actually a double act with Alison and myself. So Alison's going to start by providing some background to the pathways and then she'll hand over to me and I'll describe some of the results. So Alison, do you want Thank to you. go Thanks, ahead Paula, and tell so me when to move? Yes, the first slide, please, Paula. Okay, so, so as, as, as Mikhail described, um, each of the 20 fable countries has defined during this Senathon process with stakeholders has defined two or three pathways, um, a current trends pathway, and then either one or two sustainable pathways. And most of the countries use the Fable calculator to do their modeling, but a, a small number of countries use the MAGPIE global partial equilibrium land use systems model. And the pathway is run until 2050 in each case. Next slide, please. So we're aiming to meet uh, globally by the when you add all the different country pathways together, we're aiming to meet these four different global targets. So for food security, it's, it's based around the average minimum daily calorie requirement in all countries. For land and biodiversity, we're trying to meet no net loss of land where natural processes predominate. And that's a kind of amalgamated data set, which includes intact forest land, key biodiversity areas, and also low impact areas with, with low human impact. And then by 2050, we want to increase the area of that land by at least 20% and also have zero net deforestation by 2030. For greenhouse gas emissions, we want to have um, global emissions from agriculture less than four gig gigatons by 2050. And we want to have a net sink of global emissions from all land use and land use change activities. And then for, we also have a target for water use, which is a quantitative target. Next slide, please. Uh, as you can see here, there are very different assumptions across the 20 different countries. Um, in, in general, the sustainable pathways are characterised by lower population in some cases. Um, in many countries, they reduce their total calorie consumption, that's in the more developed countries. But in some of the less developed countries, they, they aim to increase their calorie consumption. Um, higher crop and livestock productivity is a key feature of most of the sustainable pathways. Uh, very mixed assumptions on imports and exports. Most countries have higher afforestation in their sustainable pathways and also reduced food loss and reduced food waste. But I want to point out that um, although it's a very complicated model, there are still some limitations. So, for example, we don't currently represent organic farming or agroecology or agroforestry in our models. So it's based around a kind of land sparing approach, but we don't model any specific land sharing in terms of having more sustainable agriculture in the areas where farming does take place. Next slide, please. Uh, and next slide again. So for the UK pathways, um, we went through a stakeholder input process and some of the people here today helped us with, during that process. Um, so we invited key policymakers from the UK government and evolved regions. Uh, we couldn't at that stage contact anyone from Northern Ireland. So I'm really glad that we've now got a couple of Northern Ireland representatives here today. Uh, but we had representatives from Scotland and Wales and also expert researchers from, um, for example, UKCH and Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, and we produced a, a flyer and then we held some structured discussions in two parts, first in October 2019 and then later with a workshop in February 2020 and subsequent emails and phone discussions. So the stakeholders had, had a lot of impact, a lot of input to our pathways, helping us to choose the best parameters for the UK version of the Fable calculator. And then we also had Mike Bourne from um, DEFRA seconded to us for one month to help us look at future options for developing the model into a more spatial model in future. Next slide, please. So this is a, a very brief summary of our pathways, and then I'll, I've got a few more slides that will go through them in a bit more detail. So broadly speaking, the current trends pathway is based on current policy. Um, and then the sustainable high ambition pathway is a very ambitious pathway based on the adopting the Eat Well diet, a very significant increase in tree planting, a slight increase in protected areas, uh, ambitious increases in crop yields and livestock productivity and pasture stocking density and, and also decreases in food waste. So I'm going, I'm going to go through these in a bit more detail now. So, so next slide, please, Paula. So for land use and biodiversity, uh, we have a sort of medium projection for population change. 
And then for urban expansion, that's based on current projections for housing needs, uh, which is an increase of 26,000 hectares per year between now and 2050 for the current trends and the medium ambition scenario. But for the high ambition, we assume that that could be only half that rate if we have, for example, more compact housing growth. For tree planting, um, the current trends is a continuation of the current levels, which is 9,000 hectares per year. Uh, and then the medium and high ambition matches the CCC scenarios. So that's 30,000 hectares a year, which is the current target. Or in the high ambition, a very, very ambitious 50,000 hectares per year. And I know that a number of people have actually said that this is really not, not achievable, but, but we, we thought we'd explore it anyway, since it's um, the purpose of the model is to test the very most um, sort of extreme scenarios which are possible. And then for protected areas, um, the current trends remains at the current 27.6%. And I should point out that these are not all kind of high, high biodiversity protected areas. They include national parks and AONVs, which clearly have a very large amount of farmland, which is not high biodiversity value. Um, in the medium ambition scenario, based on the 25 year environment plan ambition for an extra half a million hectares of land for nature recovery, we assume that all that area would become protected. And then for the high ambition, we have an additional target to protect all the peatland, which is currently not protected. And that brings the total area up to 29.6% of total land. So it's still a relatively small increase. Next slide, please. For crops, we've got quite ambitious targets for crop productivity increases in the high ambition. So the medium ambition is all crop yields increased by 39%. And that's based on the revised CCC medium ambition scenario. And the high ambition, they increase by 65%. So, for example, for wheat, um, that would go up from the current average of 7.7 .7 tonnes per hectare up to 12.7 tonnes per hectare average yield in, in the high ambition. So this is still pretty ambitious. We do include climate change impacts. And we assume that in the current trends, we're looking at RTP 6.0. But in the high ambition scenarios, we're looking at RTP 2.6, so a lower impact from climate change. Um, and then for post-harvest losses, um, we're currently losing 1% for crop products, and then we're assuming that's going to go down to 0.5% in the medium ambition scenario. And in the high ambition scenario, also going down to 0.5%, but earlier by 2030. Next slide, please. For livestock, I'm just going to look at the bottom line first here, which is stocking density. So for, we're assuming that the livestock productivity improvements for ruminants occur through increasing the stocking density. 1.2 livestock units per hectare at the moment up to 1.2 in the medium ambition or 1.7 in the high ambition and that's in line with the ccc high ambition scenario for that high ambition scenario we have had this query you know some people have pointed out that actually because of animal welfare and water quality impacts and so on um, the current ambition is actually to reduce stocking densities rather than increase them so again this is a very ambitious assumption and then looking at the, the upper rows there for livestock productivity, in the current trends, we're assuming a continued increase in milk yield by 18%. Um, that's half the current rate of increase because we assume there will be some kind of flattening off eventually and no increase in yields for the other categories. But for the medium ambition, we've also got an increase in poultry productivity. Um, I should point out that these are not carcass weights. So we're not talking about 15 kilogram chickens here. This is actually the um, total yield in kilograms of meat per head of herd at any one time during the year. And then for the high ambition scenario, um, milk yield increases by a higher amount, 27% of the current rate, which is 75% of the current rate of increase. Next slide, please, Paula. This is the last slide before I hand over to Paula. So for food, we're assuming that um, the current trends is the same as the current diet. The medium ambition is in line with the CCC medium ambition scenario. So that's a 20% reduction in meat and dairy consumption by 2050. And then the high ambition is the eat well diet, which has a much stronger increase, a decrease, sorry, in, in dairy in particular, and, and also a slightly higher decrease in red meat consumption and a much higher fruit and vegetable consumption. And then for food waste, we're assuming a decrease from current levels of 14% to 12.5% in, in the medium ambition or 7% in the high ambition. And I'm going to hand over to Paula now to talk through the results. OK, thank you, Alison. So, yeah, I'm going to present um, results for a few indicators, both at the global level and uh, for the UK, based on the assumptions that Alison's just presented. And I'm going to start by um, looking at the bigger picture of actually what happens to, to land use 
uh, change at the global level first, and then we'll zone in on uh, the UK. So here in the stacked bars on the right hand side of the plot, you've got the current trends pathway that all of the country teams um, submitted and were linked together in the upper stacked bar and a sustainable pathway because some country teams only did two pathways, one current trends and one sustainable and other country teams did two and were able to bring in a medium ambition as well as a high ambition sustainable scenario. So what we can see in the current trends for land use change is uh, we see over time an increase in both pasture area and crop lands. So the yellow and the lime green blocks in this upper graph. Um, and we see simultaneously, we see slight decreases in forest land here at the bottom, despite some uh, new forest areas through afforestation, we're still seeing deforestation. And we also see some decreases in other natural land. And that's primarily driven at least half of uh, almost half of that total agricultural expansion is driven by um, the assumptions over diets, which continue to have higher consumption of livestock products. And that has implications again for expansion of productive areas of certain crops. And we see expansions in planted area of wheat, corn and sorb sorghum. sorghum. Um, and um, this has implications again then for the overall land use change in the current trends pathway. If we look at the lowest um, graphic of the bar, stacked bars and the sustainable pathway, here you can see that uh, we see decreases in um, pasture land right from 2020 and in cropland from 2030. Um, and this provides sufficient face, um, space to begin to have um, net gains in forest area and increases in other natural areas. And this is um, largely driven again by shifts towards more uh, healthy and sustainable diets um, that involve uh, a lower uh, meat consumption. And this changes the composition of global cropland areas and we see um, 70 million hectares less of corn planted area and significantly more planted area being dedicated to nuts and pulses. If we look at what does that mean for the UK and here we've got the three pathways that Alison described the underlying assumptions behind. And again, if we look again at the upper stacked bar for the current trends scenario initially, here you can see that you get increases in urban area in red, in cropland and in pasture land over time, but also some increase in forest area as our afforestation targets are gradually being met. But the increases in all of these areas mean that there's a great squeeze on other natural lands such as heathlands and wetlands and bogs. And that is to such extent under the assumptions in the current trend scenarios that all unprotected other natural land is lost by 2025. And this means that um, ultimately we're not able to meet our forestation targets because there's no land left available to meet them with, um, um, even though those targets are relatively low. And again, this is driven by um, the assumption of our continuing current diet um, and continuing, continuing high levels consumption of beef, lamb and milk. Um, and also the cropland area, we see expansion in the area of wheat, barley and rapeseed, again, uh, reacting to internal increases in demand for livestock feed, for non-food products and also for biofuels. And then if we look at the sustainable pathways in the lower two bar charts, um, mainly particularly focusing on the high ambition sustainable pathway, which shows the greatest difference. And here you can see quite large decreases in both cropland and particularly in pasture land over time. And we also have a lower rate of urban expansion as explained um, by Alison, as this is assumed to be half the rate as under the current trends. And of course, this then um, frees up land to allow afforestation targets to be met and also leads to substantial increases in other natural land as farmland that is no longer needed is abandoned and uh, naturally regenerates to um, either woodlands or short vegetation. And here again, this um, 
the, these changes in the sustainable pathway are driven by largely by dietary changes through decreased demand for meat um, and increased demand for vegetables um, and other um, products, but also through um, the assumptions around increased agricultural productivity. That means that more um, yields are possible on a smaller area of land. Then if we look in more detail at one aspect of that land use change, particularly looking at what's happening to global forest cover change. And here we have the global target of meeting zero net deforestation by 2030. Again, if you look at the graphic, the red dots illustrate the current trends pathway. So you can see that under this um, scenario, we still have um, uh, net, deep, net forest loss by quite significant amounts, so that by 2030, the timescale of the target, we're still seeing net forest losses of around 20 million hectares per year. This does decrease gradually up to 2050, but we're still seeing net forest loss globally of around 15 million hectares per year. Now we can compare that with our global um, aggregate sustainable pathways, which are shown as the average in the black dots with the balance of net forest gain and net forest loss in the bars beneath those black dots. And here we can see that it is possible to uh, move to um, zero net deforestation by 2030 and the target is achieved. Um, and we see that by 2030, we're ending up with about a net gain of around 15 million hectares per year in forests. Um, and that is principally due to um, significant actions in a number of countries to um, stop deforestation, but also to have ambitious afforestation targets, particularly in Brazil and Indonesia and in the US, India, Australia and Ethiopia. So if we sorry, look at uh, one other aspect of that land use change where um, Alison introduced um, the target that we have that is related to um, biodiversity. And again, uh, this is always a difficult one to relate in a way to each individual country because it has to be applicable across all of the countries in the consortium. So we're using this aggregate indicator of land where natural processes dominate. And we have the two targets of no net loss by 2030 and an increase of at least 20% by 2050. And at the global scale, um, we are able to achieve that first target of no net loss under both the current trends and the sustainable pathway, with the current trends um, pa uh, pathways leading to a 1% increase in land where natural processes dominate by 2050. Um, and the sustainable pathway leading to an 8% increase, again, largely driven by changes in a few countries, particularly those countries that are driving down deforestation and increasing afforestation, such as Brazil, the US and China. If we look at the UK and the graph on the right shows the results for the UK, um, here again, we see under the current trends, a very slight decrease in land where natural processes dominate. And that is related to the land use changes that we simulate under this scenario, where we see large increases in urban area and in, in a whole range of farmland and a complete squeeze on um, forest areas in part and particularly on other natural land. Whereas under the two sustainable pathways, we see the area of land where natural processes dominate significantly increase. And again, this is due to um, the reductions that we see in farmland and the increases that we see in um, afforestation and other natural land. If I move on to look, sorry, at um, greenhouse gas emissions, first again looking globally, and here we have two targets, as Alison explained, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, so from crops and livestock, and that um, threshold of less than four gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year um, is based on scientific evidence from the literature to be consistent with the Paris Agreement targets of two degrees and 1.5 degrees. And the second target is that greenhouse gas emissions from Lulu CF should be below um, net zero. 
Um, and if we look um, at the current trend scenario, here we see certainly that emissions from uh, agriculture miss by a very wide margin the, the um, target. In fact, they're 80% greater than the target, showing that countries really need to substantially increase their current efforts to get anywhere near the Paris Agreement target. But if we look at the sustainable pathway and what that looks like globally, we see that actually the target can be, met, can be met and actually both targets are met from agriculture and from Lulu CF. Um, and particularly the graph on the right shows the main contributors to achieving the uh, greenhouse gas reductions from agriculture. Um, and that's particularly dominated by uh, reductions uh, due to changes in deforestation and livestock emissions. Um, with India particularly being key to this, but also Brazil, the US, China and Indonesia. And if we look at the role that um, the UK plays in uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, again here in this slide, um, we can see in the black solid line here, the projection of changes in greenhouse gas emissions under the current trend scenario. And here we see uh, slight reductions um, to 2050, Again, this is reflecting the fact that some farmland is being converted to urban areas or being afforested. But by contrast, if we look under the two sustainable scenario, under the medium ambition, we see a 36% reduction in comparison to current trends. And under the high ambition, we see 123% reduction in comparison to the current trends. So in this high ambition, a scenario where turning um, what was a net um, emission into a net sink. Um, and again, if we look at sort of the sources in this, the right hand side, we can see the general sources under the current trends. And we can see that most sources of those emissions are still coming from livestock and also from cropland. Um, again, if you look at the graph on the right hand side, again, if you look at the scale, which is looking at it, which has negative values, you can see that most of the contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions comes from um, reduction in livestock and also increases in sequestration through um, increasing forested lands through the afforestation targets, but also through uh, land abandonment from farmland, um, uh, meaning that those greenhouse gas emissions are lost through land use change. Whoops, sorry. So my last um, indicator I was going to look was um, focusing on food security and dietary change. Um, I guess his, as Alison mentioned here, the, go, the global target is related to calorie consumption being greater than a minimum daily energy requirement. And for some countries here, the um, requirement was to reduce uh, calorific consumption. So particularly for those countries that have more dietary risks due to obesity or overweight. Um, issues uh, such as in developing nations such as the UK and the US and in other countries such as in Rwanda and Ethiopia it was to increase calorific values, um, calor calorific consumption uh, to address food security issues. So each country addressed this in different ways but overall what we saw was that um, we see under the current trends pathway um, a overall slight increase in the average calorie consumption per capita per day at the global level by 8%. But in the sustainable pathway, we see a decrease in overall calorific consumption of 3%. And this puts less pressure on the land use system. Um, and particularly we see in the sustainable pathway, a strong reduction in the consumption of red meat and in um, sugar. So if we look at what does that mean in terms of UK diets, um, here again, I'm just showing two scenarios, the current trends, which assumes the current UK diet and the sustainable high ambition scenario, which assumes the eat well diet. Here we look at uh, the consumption of different food groups relative to the recommendations from the Eat Lancet report. So the minimum calorific consumption is the inner ring, the maximum is the outer ring. So looking at this under our current diet in the current trend scenarios, we are over consuming red meat, sugar and roots and also eggs and milk. Uh, so under the eat well diet, if we look at how that changes, we can see that we are able to move the consumption of all groups within the recommended levels. Some still at the maximum and edge of those recommended levels, 
but we are still over consuming in roots and particularly this is relation to um, uh, over consumption and over production of potatoes and again if we look at what does that mean overall under the um, current pathways uh, we basically see that uh, we are 32 percent higher than the minimum daily dietary energy requirement at the national level and this corresponds with approximately 30 percent of adults still being classified as obese and about 60 percent being overweight but in moving to the eat well diet means that um, our computed average calorific intakes decreases to only being four percent above the minimum daily um, daily energy requirement. So just to finish with some conclusions. Um, yeah, so at the global scale, we have shown that uh, current trends pathways lead most countries towards unsustainable land and food systems, uh, both within those countries and at the global level, and that sustainable pathways are able to both meet targets related to food security, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, water use and biodiversity. And out of the seven global targets that each country team was aiming to achieve, we were able to meet six of those uh, concurrently. Uh, looking at the UK, again, we saw uh, a very extreme case in the current trend scenario, uh, where basically through the expansion of urban area and farmland, um, all unprotected land was lost and tree planting targets could not be met. And again, as Alison said, this is looking at those lands in the more of a land sparing look into rather than a land sharing. And we're looking to improve the calculator to bring those issues into it in the future. But it still shows that the sustainable pathways do illustrate the importance of things like dietary change and productivity improvements for freeing up land for biodiversity and carbon storage and enabling that transition to both a healthy and sustainable food and land use system. So overall, I think that what we're trying to show in, in FABLE is that um, through integrated and decisive action, there is things that governments and other stakeholders can do to try and meet the relevant targets and objectives of international agreements, such as the Paris Agreement, CBD and the SDGs. But the results do highlight uh, different trade-offs and synergies and strong dependence between climate, food and biodiversity targets that are important to consider in the different countries when they're developing existing and emerging policies. Um, and I'll come back to next steps after uh, because I want to open it up for a discussion. But um, the tools are uh, openly available from the Fable website. So people can do that, download both of the global calculator, the Fable calculator and the global dashboard. Um, and we're aware that there are ways we want to improve our, our pathways and the modelling tools, for example, including peatlands in a better way, improving the representation of grasslands and forest types. Uh, being able to represent land sharing management practices in a better way and also then moving down to look at subnational versions of the Fable calculator for the four UK nations and eventually to spatial explicit modelling. And then just finally just to um, finish with uh, that we do have funding from the SCDO over three years uh, for the Fable Secretariat to develop a food environment land and development policy action tracker which is uh, synergist to the climate action tracker that is used to track the progress of different countries towards the Paris Agreement. The idea of the failed policy action tracker is really to focus on policies in different countries that are related to food and land use systems. And the UK will be a pilot country in this, so we will work closely with the Fable Secretariat in uh, pushing this uh, forwards. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much.